Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Russia is retaliating against a reported push by Ukraine into Russian territory. Russia's military put out this video claiming to show an attack on Ukrainian soldiers near Russia's Kursk region, which is now the scene of fierce fighting. Ukraine is taking the fight into Russia. This video posted on social media allegedly shows its forces pouring over the border while another on a pro-Ukrainian account appears to show Russian soldiers surrendering in large numbers. Moscow is scrambling to block the advance with artillery and airstrikes. Russia's top general tries to project an image of control, telling President Vladimir Putin the offensive of a thousand Ukrainian troops has been halted. On the ground, a stunned Russian man tells the camera the fighting has damaged everything in his village. The White House says it wants to know Kyiv's endgame. We are going to continue to stay focused on making sure they have what they need to defend themselves against Russia's aggression. Ukraine is targeting Russia's Kursk region, far away from the main front lines in the east and south. The two-year-old war has ground to a stalemate. Moscow throws wave after wave at Ukrainian defenses, making small but costly gains. Meanwhile, Russian missiles continue to rain down on Ukrainian cities. On Tuesday, one damaged a clinic in Kharkiv. Ukraine hopes the recently delivered F-16 fighter jets can protect its skies and help turn the tide of the war. North Korea says it has deployed 250 new tactical ballista missile launchers along its front lines, vowing to enhance its nuclear capabilities to defend itself. This is a picture released by North Korea's state-run news agency on Monday, showing what appears to be the transporter erector launcher vehicles for the Hwasong-11 Na close-range ballistic missiles. This is a type of tactical missile that the regime has been testing since April 2022 that's known to fly around 110 kilometers. During a ceremony held in Pyongyang, the state media reported that its leader Kim Jong-un announced that some 250 of these new tactical ballistic missile launchers have been handed to frontline units. Each of the 250 new launchers can carry four missiles, which means when operated all at once, it could be possible to launch a thousand missiles. Kim also said the North will soon gain an enhanced level of nuclear capabilities that can defend the regime and deter all types of nuclear threats. In a message towards the U.S., he reiterated that Pyongyang still has a choice of engaging in both dialogue and confrontation with Washington, but said the regime must be thoroughly prepared for confrontation. In response, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a press briefing on Monday that it's closely monitoring the situation by cooperating with the U.S. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces 
though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Israel is at war with an extreme Islamist axis in the face of an attack from Iran and its proxies. Foreign Minister Israel Katz is calling on the world to stand with the Jewish state. Meanwhile, recent Hezbollah strikes on northern Israel are raising concerns the terror group might be spearheading Iran's assault. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. As Israel prepares for an attack from Iran, Hezbollah drones and rockets injured 19 people and ignited fires across northern Israel earlier this week. Some experts believe Hezbollah may lead the attack on Israel with backing from Iran. On Wednesday, Israel's government released figures on the war with Hezbollah since October 9th. Hezbollah fired more than 7,500 rockets toward Israel, launched over 180 drones. 62 civilians and soldiers have been killed. More than 62,000 have been displaced from their homes, and 98 villages, cities, and towns in the north have been evacuated. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant warned Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah against escalating the war. From the looks of things, Nasrallah may drag Lebanon to pay heavy prices. They don't imagine what could happen. I guess if they take a look at Gaza, they will understand. But reason doesn't always prevail. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told IDF recruits the nation is ready for whatever action Iran and its proxies might take against them. I know that the citizens of Israel are on alert, and I ask you one thing, to keep your patience and calm. We're prepared for both defense and offense. We strike at our enemies and are also determined to defend ourselves. I think the nation has grown in confidence uh, as they've uh, fended off even Iranian attacks uh, mm -hmm. with, with the hand of God behind them. So yeah. it's looking better, but the the uh, Hezbollah threat, the reigning threat that we're under right now, has everyone's attention. Meanwhile, the election of Yahya Sinwar as the new head of Hamas is seen by Israel as a strengthening the relationship between Iran and the Palestinians. While Hamas officials in Lebanon praised his election to head the terror group, Israel's foreign minister, Israel Katz, posted this message on X. The election of Yahya Sinwar as the leader of Hamas must send a clear message to the world that the Palestinian issue is now completely controlled by Iran and Hamas. Without Israeli action in Gaza, the area would fall entirely under Hamas control. The world must see reality as it is and support Israel, which currently stands at the forefront of the battle against the Iranian and extremist Islamist Axis. Sinwar masterminded the October 7th massacre of 1,200 Israelis and the kidnapping of more than 250. And a new report from the U.S. Director of National Intelligence says Iran has undertaken activities that better position it to produce a nuclear device if it chooses to do so. It added, Tehran has the infrastructure and experience to quickly produce weapons-grade uranium at multiple facilities. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. In a show of force, Israeli warplanes flew low over the Lebanese capital, breaking the sound barrier several times and creating sonic booms. They were the loudest heard by residents of Beirut since Hezbollah opened up a front along the border to help Gaza 10 months ago. And it happened minutes before Hezbollah's leader was to address the one-week memorial for their slain military leader Fuad Shukr, during which he made clear Iran, Hezbollah, and Yemen's Houthis will respond to Israel's recent aggressions regardless of the consequences.
Our response is coming, God willing. The question is whether we do this independently or will there be a coordinated attack from all the members of the Axis? This is an option. Maybe we decide that it is in the interest of all if each responds alone. We may all respond at the same time. This is a big battle. Israel killed Hezbollah's chief of staff, Fouad Shukr, in an airstrike in the southern suburbs of Beirut last week. Hours later, the political head of Hamas, Ismail Hani, was assassinated in the Iranian capital, an attack Iran blamed on Israel. Hours before Nasrallah's speech, Israel's air defenses failed to intercept explosive drones launched by Hezbollah that reached some 20 kilometers south of the border with Lebanon despite the heightened state of alert. Israel has been bracing for the promised retaliation. Officials are defiant, saying the country is prepared for any scenario, including a swift transition to offense. And we're currently fighting a seven-fronted war uh, by Iran that is seeking to strangle us. But we are, of course, seeing down uh, their terrorist proxies. Tensions are at an all-time high. Streets are almost empty. It wasn't the first time we heard Israeli jets flying over Beirut, but the loud booms created panic. People were shaken and headed home. Now they and the region waits for what comes next in a dangerously escalating conflict. That wait, according to Nasrallah, is part of the punishment. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars? See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. It's a toxic cocktail of civil war, famine, and a collapsing health care system that's ravaging the people of Sudan for more than a year now. The United Nations says 14,000 people have died during fighting between the country's military and paramilitary groups since April of last year. Another 33,000 wounded and 10 million people displaced. Buildings carry the scars of the fighting. Roads littered with ammunition casings and cars riddled with bullet holes. This is what most of Sudan's capital looks like after 15 months of conflict between the army and the rapid support forces. Basic services have been disrupted in many areas. Souda Ali lives in Umdurman, the second largest city. She fills up her barrel at a water truck twice a week. Artillery shelling has destroyed pipes and supply networks in this neighborhood. The only way to get water is from tankers. We struggle to get clean water. We get tired from carrying it. And when we get home, we can barely do anything. And there isn't even enough. We only get water from the trucks every three or four days. Cleaning the house and washing clothes is difficult. Everything needs water. Street battles have damaged electricity poles, interrupting power supplies. This is the first time in months Nazar Ibrahim has had electricity. The army recently regained areas from the paramilitary group and repaired some of the power grid. Electricity is a necessity in life. It is a major part of our lives, so its restoration encourages people to return home. I had reached a point where it was a luxury to find somewhere to charge my phone and call my family outside the country. Now finally, I can do that at home. Hospitals have been damaged, limiting people's access to health care and law and order no longer exists in areas under arrest of control. Because of that, most of the streets in the capital now look like this one. Very little signs of life and activity, and reminders that there were once people here who have since been forced to leave. Khartoum was once home to more than 8 million people. Many have left because of the violence or lack of services, and those who've stayed have to deal with what it's become, a battlefield for two generals who once ruled it together. Fresh fighting in the eastern DRC between the country's military and M23 rebels has forced nearly 100 Congolese police officers to flee to neighboring Uganda. Officers arrived via the Ishasha border crossing in Kanungu district towards Uganda's south, according to the country's military spokesperson. Well, this comes as the M23 have taken control of the large strategic eastern town of Nyamilima, 
And that's despite a ceasefire brokered by Angola on Sunday, which followed a two-week humanitarian truce between the rebels and DRC military. Violence in North Kivu has been raging for nearly two and a half years. With more than 2,500 Congolese refugees arriving into Uganda over the past four days alone. Reeling from Friday's deadly attack, these Mogadishu residents are determined to pay their respects to the victims. On Monday, hundreds rallied in the Somalian capital to denounce the latest assault commandeered by the Al Shabaab terrorist group. I'm calling for the Somali people to wake up and fight against Al Shabaab. You shouldn't be intimidated. The killers are claiming the Somali identity, but they are not Somalis. On the 2nd of August, a gunman and a suicide bomber attacked the busy Lido beachfront, a popular area for tourists and residents. They killed at least 37 people and injured over 200 others, making it the deadliest act of violence in Somalia in recent months. What had happened here was a mass killing, and it's a national disaster, and someone needs to be accountable for it. For over 17 years, Al-Shabaab's been waging a deadly insurgency against Somalia's federal government. The group's fighters remain present in rural areas in the south and center of the country, despite being ousted from the capital in 2011. To combat the group, President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed launched an all-out war against the militants in 2022, joining forces with local militias and with the support of the African Union and the United States. However, the offensive has suffered setbacks, with al-Shabaab claiming it had captured multiple locations in the center of the country earlier this year. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting, as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him, and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. You probably felt it. It was one of the strongest earthquakes in a long time and it hit last night near Bakersfield. And it turns out it may have been on a fault that experts didn't even know about. In fact, the aftershocks are still happening. We had another one just minutes ago. There are hundreds of fault lines already mapped in our region. And after last night's quake, the data suggests that they may have just discovered a new one. Tuesday's magnitude 5.2 earthquake centered about 15 miles southwest of Lamont, California in Kern County was big enough that people reported shaking in Santa Clarita, downtown Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Long Beach and beyond. I felt something shake, but I was like, ah, it must just be the car. I'm living in West LA, it's just a little bit shaking. I'm in Pasadena. I was thinking about whether it's need to run, but I feel like it's not that strong. The Templar caused this large boulder to fall onto the freeway in the back. It triggered the state's early warning system, sending an alert on many people's phones seconds before they felt the shaking. A strong 7.8 earthquake hitting the southern coast of Japan, triggering a tsunami warning. The earthquake was centered in waters off the eastern coast of Japan's southern main island, uh, Kuyushu. Three people were injured, but no serious damage was reported. But residents were urged to stay clear of the coastline after the Japan Meteorological Agency said tsunami waves of up to 1.6 feet were detected. The Japanese Meteorological Agency has issued a mega quake advisory after a magnitude 7.1 earthquake struck Kyushu Thursday afternoon. It's part of the Nankai Trough Earthquake Extra Information Protocol, which is a precautionary measure ahead of a possible mega earthquake. The agency says there is a higher than usual potential for one occurring in the expected hypocenter of a mega earthquake in the Nankai Trough area. Officials are urging people to take disaster prevention measures in accordance with information provided by the central and local governments. Preparations include reviewing local evacuation plans and routes, as well as ensuring furniture is fixed in place and checking emergency supplies like food and water. 
This follows analysis conducted by the Japanese government's Earthquake Research Committee. It estimates there's a high chance a magnitude 8 or 9 tremor could happen in the Nankai Trough over the next 30 years. Luke 2111, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. There are five earthquakes that occur during the seven year tribulation, three of which are called great earthquakes. The largest and final earthquake to ever rattle planet Earth takes place during the last half of the seven year tribulation, as we read in Revelation 16 17 through 20. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. We begin with Tropical Storm Debbie making landfall now for the second time overnight. Let's go right to Ginger in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, tracking the flash flooding emergency, the tornadoes with the dangerous weather on the move. Overnight, a likely tornado tearing through Lucama, North Carolina. This middle school's classroom ceiling collapsed. Debris everywhere. Tropical Storm Debbie made a second landfall overnight near Bulls Bay, South Carolina. A huge part of North Carolina waking up smothered in flash flood warnings. From Raleigh to Charlotte, back to Florence, South Carolina. And that is after more than 18 inches in some spots already. Up to 14 inches of rain in Georgia stressing dams like this one outside Savannah in Bullock County. One official calling the scene an unprecedented event. Crews making at least 75 water rescues. Officials going door to door warning people. And we're not forcing them to leave, but making them aware of the threat in terms of harm to them. Vehicles unwisely driving into flood water, and the driver of this white pickup regretting it. In Evans County, Georgia, after three days of rain, people up to their waist in water. Today, cleaning up and salvaging what they can. Everything in the house is underwater appliances, beds, everything. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. This morning, from a tropical storm to tornado fears, a possible twister touching down near Raleigh, North Carolina, damaging this middle school. It comes after a tornado tore through the central part of the state in Sampson County yesterday. I was very scared. This tropical storm, Debbie, continues to soak the East Coast. North Carolina's governor warning his state could get hit with more rain in one day than they normally see in months, urging people to stay off the roads. Now is not the time to see if your car floats because it doesn't. 20 million people are under flood alerts from Georgia to New York. In Bullock County, Georgia, a number of roads washed out after dams were overpowered by fast moving floodwaters. Rains from the tropical storm already flooding communities as far north as New York and New Jersey. And all the water overflowed into our homes over here. Starling air travel with serious flight delays up and down the East Coast. We were just devastated. It was bad. And today is a double threat. Those in Debbie's path are under a flood risk, but we are also seeing a potential tornado risk that could be higher than any day we have seen so far. Like these children in the Chinese city of Shanghai, people across Northeast Asia are finding different ways to get through this punishing heat wave. Soaring temperatures have set a daily record for maximum demand on the power grid as this city of 25 million people tries to keep cool. In Japan, the heat wave has proved deadly. 
with more than 100 people dying of suspected heat stroke in Tokyo in July, a month that recorded the country's hottest day since records began. With temperatures this year more than two degrees above average, the authorities have set up cooling centers and mist spraying stations for tourists and local people alike. I get so sweaty. I can literally squeeze out the sweat from my shirt. In Japanese schools, children and their teachers are also suffering. Children can no longer do what they used to do, like playing in the schoolyard. This is the reality of school life today. While inside some older schools, a lack of insulation means air conditioning systems strain to keep classrooms cool enough. In South Korea, Seoul has activated its special situation room to coordinate efforts. And street cleaning trucks are being used to cool road surfaces to keep temperatures down, especially in the cities. For more than two weeks, Seoul, like many other major cities, has endured the so-called tropical night phenomenon, with nighttime temperatures staying consistently above 25 degrees Celsius, and with this heat wave set to continue for at least another week. In North Korea, unprecedented summer rains have caused extensive flooding along its border with China and prompted leader Kim Jong-un to dispatch thousands of volunteers. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past, and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, 
God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.